All right, thank you. And thank you all for coming out. This It seems like it's going to be a stormy evening. I don't know what's going to happen, but maybe we'll hang out here for a few hours while it blows over and I can geek out with you. So we came up with the most alliterative possible program title. Uh, and it was funny because I, I originally proposed this as kind of a joke, but I proposed it to librarians. They're like, oh, we can add more Ps. Like, let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so voila. Uh, but in essence, really what it is is sort of an overview of kind of what's happening in the space that I'm going to give you. Uh, and there's about 150 odd slides that I'm going to run through really fast. Don't worry, there's a URL at the end and I'm sure it'll be available so you can uh, take a look at it again. But then also really to have kind of a discussion and talk about whatever it is that comes to your mind, what you want to learn. I'll preface this by saying there's only so much an individual can do. And I'll show you some of the tricks and some of the technologies you can use as an individual. But if there's one take home message, it's that an individual is, while not powerless, of limited agency to protect your privacy. And that's really what the Facebook Cambridge Analytica story is all about. It's not just what you choose to post online. It's, you know, Nathaniel putting this online and having your face in a video and facial recognition tagging you without even your knowledge that, oh, you've been hanging out with troublemakers like Professor Meinrath, therefore you're part of some social graph already. And that's happening, if you can imagine, how many pictures are being taken on campus this week. You're in the background, if you're downtown, of lots of extremely high def pictures that are showing where you are, when you were there, who you were with, and all of that is part of Facebook's data set. So, all right, let's begin with a quick review of the state of Washington, D.C. through my eyes, or in this case, through the eyes of Arthur C. Clarke. And I think this is important because as a science fiction writer, he's talking about what may be the mythology of future tech. But when you think about D.C., this is like the bubble in which most key decision makers live as well. They're like, I have no idea how this technology works. And they really have no idea how these technologies work. So what do I do? I work in DC. And I think like, I'm the most important person, I'll use that term loosely, in the Wizard of Oz, right? I'm this guy. I show people what's really happening behind the curtain. I expose the technologies, the business models, right? I'm the unsung hero who never really gets their fair time in the spotlight. And there's a bunch of us, right? It's like a pack of terrier dogs, right? That, that are doing this kind of work. But on the public interest side, that pack is probably countable on my fingers and toes. And that's it. So take that up against all of the lobbying power of all of the telcos and the big tech, right? The Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple, quintuplets, and you realize just how outgunned we are in these spaces. Now, what's also happening, and there's a couple of things going on in this graph, but really the important element is that over the last 30, 40, 50 years, at a time where you've got this unprecedented shift, right, a digital age, a digital revolution, like the industrial revolution or agricultural revolution taking place, the number of laws that are being passed is dropping, and it's dropping fairly systematically over time. So you've got increasing change, a slowing of legislative like updates, and so what you end up with naturally, would be a growing divide between technological realities and legal realities. And this is across almost every sector. Any place where technology intersects, which is pretty much every place in your lived lives, our laws are becoming increasingly out of date. And whereas 20 years, 20 years ago, meant something important, 20 years now is like even larger a gulf 
because the iteration of technology is accelerating. So here's what it looks like. It's pretty bleak, right? And the end result is a society that is in a serious state of regulatory, legislative, policy, rule of law decay when it comes to mapping onto what's actually happening in our lived lives. So, what I call this is the gulf of ignorance, right? And you can imagine if this is technology, or let's call it just the internet, and this is the technological acumen of the people making decisions, the end result is that ever, like when you go, and I, I work a lot on the Hill, so I get to meet the legislators. These are not evil people doing evil deeds, right? They're not the Mr. Burns of Simpsons fame, right? These are folks that just have never had to know the technologies, have never been exposed to people who are telling them the implications, have never actually had to deal with the on-the-ground lived experiences, who have no idea, honestly, have no idea what Facebook is actually up to. And what this looks like is very, <laughs> I think, very troubling. Right, so here you have a time Diane Feinstein was overseeing the NSA. And this is right after the Snowden files were first coming out and people were saying, hey, the NSA is doing all this surveillance and here's her response. <laughs> That's troubling. I'm like, wait, I don't understand. You're supposed to be like the most informed individual because right, you're supposed to be overseeing this and holding them to account. And what you're saying is you're not even clued in to know what they can and cannot be doing. And it's all of Congress, right? It's not just, you know, Pelosi or Feinstein or McConnell, Ryan, right? It's the whole damn thing. They pass laws and then are like shocked, simply shocked when people are actually using the powers that were granted to these agencies. So one of the reasons why this happens, and there are many, many reasons, but one of the reasons is when you look at who's making decisions about technology, it's lawyers, it's not the technologists. In fact, the technologists aren't even in the room. And the infestation of lawyers in DC is long-standing and pretty exceptional, right? So there's New York, it's number two with its 87 per 10,000 residents. And here's Washington, DC. Boom. Right, we got lawyers everywhere. And because of that, the lens through which everything is viewed is not technology. It's legal frameworks. But what are these legal frameworks? These are legal frameworks that are increasingly out of date and don't map onto actual technology. And this is a huge problem. So you have ever more convoluted laws, lawyers being too clever by far, trying to shoehorn things together to address whatever comes across their desk next without doing the kind of comprehensive framework reform that we actually need to be doing. Right? You see that in the fact that legislation is just not being passed. You would think with what's been happening in society, say, since the mid-80s with you know, computers and the internet, that we'd probably have a spate of laws and for those of us in telecom, we know, like, when's the last major overhaul of internet governance or internet regulation? 1996. Right? You guys remember what the internet looked like in 96? <laughs> A little bit different than it does today. And we have no laws, no comprehensive reforms since then. That's pretty shocking. So it's no wonder then that in this wild west where there's no rules of the road, companies are doing whatever they want because there's nothing to say you can't make a profit doing this because it lies outside of our frameworks. It's in the realm of sort of not illegal, maybe unethical, unprofessional, like untoward, whatever, but not necessarily illegal. It should be. 
So this provides both this dangerous time and also this great opportunity. We get to live. We're the guinea pigs for this, right? And the next generation, the folks graduating on campus this week, they are really the guinea pigs for that. And we, we sort of got a glancing blow from the detriments of all of this. But they are completely immersed in these digital ecosystems, these frameworks, where in essence, if you were to take this and run it through like a institutional review board, people would be like, oh, hell no, you're not allowed to do that, <laughs> right? Like it would be professionally unethical to subject people to that level of discrimination over this period of time without their informed consent. And since all of you I know read all of the privacy and acceptable use policies of everything before clicking the yes, I agree button, you know that even if you read that, you can't give informed consent. Because what they basically say is, and you consent to whatever we change this to. Which again, if this were an institutional review board, if I was doing research as a professional, they'd be like, no, you can't, you can't just say like, we're going to do whatever we want. And yet that's what the world that we live in right now. So originally, if folks recognize this, is that original New Yorker article that was like, hey, look, you know, like online, this is the world. And it was understood that this was the world. Anonymity online was not the exception, it was the rule. And then today, you have something a little bit different, right? You have a world where they know exactly who you are, where you're being tracked every which different way, where the ability to have an alias or anonymity is de facto non-existent. And again, that has real world implications, not just for Superman, but like for you and I as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So, now what you have is Congress being like, oh, like there's a thing, it's Facebook, we're gonna learn all about it in like two days, we're gonna have a whole bunch of like hearings, yada, yada, yada. I say look to the stock price of Facebook to understand how completely ineffectual all of this dog and pony show is. Right, so here's what happens, right? This is whatever, like this is the market correction, right? It's the, the self, guidance that the, you know, like markets respond by doing what's right by consumers, blah, blah, blah. And if they don't, they get harmed, right? This is what, this is the rubric that we're told. And right about, actually, yeah, it was right about beginning of April, I told my class, buy Facebook stock. You want to make a quick buck? Because I teach about the political economics of tech. And I can tell you, like this, is going to turn into that. Which is to say, a month later, Facebook has gained almost all of its original value. And the interesting thing is like right in here is where those hearings were. So what's the function of the hearings as far as I can tell? It's to bolster Facebook stock price. It's to signal to the markets that in fact we're not going to do anything. And the markets respond. Certainly, if markets thought, oh, Congress is serious, you wouldn't go from this to that in the ensuing weeks. I think that's really important for all of the rhetoric. This makes no sense given what's making the headlines that Congress says it's going to do. So, in technology, there are those of us that give a chuckle to something like this, and those of us that are like, I don't get it. It's fine if you don't get it, other than to say, like, binary is important, and 10 means 2. Therefore, ha-ha, very funny. But, like, if I do this, if I do this in Washington, D.C., there'll be, like, two people laughing in an audience of thousands, right? Like, <laughs> that depresses me a little bit, right? So... When you look at technology, we're actually regressing. So here's a screenshot, thank you, Internet Archive, of Skype, a product that a lot of people have used all the time. And if you look right here, you can see that they're very clear. This is their home page and saying we're using end-to-end -end encryption. That's important. And why is it important? Well, so you had the six years of pretty secure Skype communication. 
It's what allowed Skype to expand so rapidly. It became the de facto standard. It allowed human rights workers and working in many of the world's hotspots to use Skype knowing that their, the integrity of their communications was safe. And then something weird happened. Something very weird happened, which didn't make sense. Skype was not an American company. Right? It's Estonian. It's the Estonian success story. Estonia, by the way, having gone from way behind us in pretty much all technology to way ahead of us. I was there in the fall. And Estonia like kicks us to the broadband curb <laughs> when it comes to all <laughs> things tech savvy and 21st century. And the reason why this matters is because really what this is about is a business model and a set of requirements mandated by the US government to make our communications less secure. Right? CALEA is the Communications Assistance to Law Enforcement Act, and it mandates that if you're running communications, you must be surveillable which we'd been told was, well, if we get a warrant and we need to look at your communications, we need to actually be able to tap those communications. That's explicitly what we were told. The reality is something very different. I'll talk a little bit about this. So today, when you try to read like what the heck they're doing, you get a whole bunch of gobbledygook here. And my favorite part is this last part but in the future it will only be sent via our cloud to provide the optimal user experience, which is, <laughs> there's no reason to break your security for an optimal user experience. I can't figure, like, what optimal user experience is gained by having my communications be less secure? So, and you can see, I won't play this now, but you can, ha you can see where like, people like Senator Wyden, who's actually one of the more tech-savvy people, is having Clapper testify to Congress and ask him explicitly, are you collecting information on Americans? And James Clapper, the head, the director of national intelligence, lies. I mean, there's no question he perjures himself before Congress. He says, no, we're not. In fact, he says, like, here's, here's what he says. <laughs> right? Like, I mean, what? <laughs> and the thing is, like, we can't even call this a lie in the media. We can't even have an honest conversation. Be like, so you lied under oath to Congress. I'm pretty sure that's a no-no. But it's not just him, right? So this is a clip of... Obama on Jay Leno, not under oath, but lying to the American people, saying there's no domestic spying program. And this was said at a time before this, right? And these are not my slides, these are the NSA's slides. And the slides that come out are actually pretty damning. All of these systems, if you recognize any of these names or use any of their products, they are completely open to the NSA. And it's interesting because at the same time, these exact same companies are saying, hey, we are protecting your privacy. They are giving your data to the NSA. This is established, verified fact. The only question is how much and uh, the extent of that, which we still can't get straight answers about. And what they're collecting and again, not my slide, this is their slides, it's pretty much everything. And it's weird because I have arguments with people where I'm like, yes, they're, ex they're collecting the content of your communications. And like, no, 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 it's just the metadata. I'm like, that's not metadata. <laughs> that's your content. And the thing is, if you think that this is just limited to these providers, think again, this is what's called section 215 of the Patriot Act, there's another section called Section 702, which is equally, perhaps even more damning, right? Which is to say this, again, not my slide, their slide. Use both, PRISM, and 
Section 702, this upstream. What does upstream mean? It means they put a giant contraption that hoovers up all of the information passing through an internet exchange point. They collect everything. You wouldn't need to build one of the largest data centers on the planet in Utah if you were just collecting metadata. Now, what's in there? I'll give you a hint. It's not just those few folks that, with, that the government has come along with a warrant to collect their information. And all of this is facilitated, greatly enhanced, by the fact that so much data is being collected on all of us that we never gave our informed consent to collect in the first place that is then turned over in partnership with the US government. And the sad reality is the US government, having done this, has now created what? An international norm that a nation state can do this. So when China obviously does the same thing, and who's the number one fiber builder on the planet? Huawei. Like, what are we going to do? Like, don't do the thing that we pioneered. This is going to haunt us. Even if we fix it today, it's going to haunt us. And that's a problem. So coming back to this, we just, earlier this year, had the opportunity to shut down this upstream data collection, collecting basically all the data from everyone without a warrant and using it for we don't know what. And so here's Trump and his infinite technological acumen talking about this bill. And it's like, to me, this is like a great, a great study. So how long does it take? This is 4.33 a.m. How long does it take the NSA to learn, like, the president just tweeted this thing, holy crap, get somebody down to the president's office and brief him on what he should say. Well, it turns out, <laughs> until 6.14 a.m. <laughs> That's how long it takes the government to respond and say, like, oh, put, put the toothpaste back in the tube. And it's crazy, right? So look at this. He's reauthorizing a bill, and in the same tweet where he's saying he's reauthorizing, he's saying it's not the same bill. So it doesn't matter. Democrat, Republican, same problem. And it's getting worse, right? Why stop at just completely eliminating Skype. There's all these other secure systems that the Attorney General of the United States is like, it's secure, we really need to make that insecure. Because trust us, we'll be the only ones <laughs> with the key. Do you believe that for a second? <laughs> like, I mean, are you kidding me? And the thing is, we did this before. We had something called the Clipper chip in the 90s that was then Senator Biden pushing to integrate into all our hardware that would have created this back door. It took a guy at AT&T, a guy named Matt Blaze, less than a year, or maybe a year and a half, to crack it. One guy. So I'm like, you want to put a back door and expect that the entire Chinese government isn't going to figure out a way to route around that? It's a one-way transformation. Once that's broken, you can't then undo it. What a stupid idea. But it only makes sense to those that don't understand the implications. I don't think that Sessions has never been like, you know what I want to do is like make all the fraud that's ever happened thus far child's play. <laughs> I want to undermine the communications, right? Because this would only affect American communications. You think the French are like, oh, hey, let's, let's harmonize with them and make all our communications insecure too. So it's like, we then get the worst security on the planet. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? And I don't think that's what he meant to do, but that's what he is pushing for. 
The Chinese will probably have better <laughs> security on their systems than we do. And it's not just that, right? Like all of our products, right? It's like, oh, I turned off geolocational tracking and Google's like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> like, we still got it. Like how does Apple know where your earphones are? Unless they're tracking them. And this has very real implications. Like, it's crazy that in 2018, the United States military accidentally exposes its secret bases because the Fitbit equivalent is tracking soldiers doing their workouts, and nobody thought, like, hey, that's probably a problem that should be addressed, right? Like, that's the first that they recognize that this might be a problem. So it goes at every single level of government, and it goes at every single level, right? This is the Vizio TVs, that it turns out they're watching you while you're watching them. And as if that wasn't enough, then Consumer Reports came out and said, actually, it's possible for hackers to break into these things because their security and encryption is so poor, and watch you. So you buy a product, and then it becomes like a mechanism for whatever to watch you in the privacy of your own home. And I'm sure somewhere in the bowels of Vizio, they were like, can we make this a feature, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> this has real world implications and there's no meaningful accountability, right? Equifax lied on multiple different levels here. And again, if you looked at Equifax's stock price, I, I haven't but I would bet it's like right back up where it was before. Because people know that there won't be. This makes me a little bit crazy, because I'm like, well, what? I mean, this is so obvious. We have so many examples. It happens so often to so many people. Why isn't it being addressed? So here's what can be done, right? First of all, it's very easy to get a little demoralized about the state of technological and legal reality. Uh, you know, I'm just going to put that out there and admit that. Like, this is not exactly a fun thing, and it feels a little daunting or overwhelming. But we've gone through this before. We went through this before with COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program that targeted pretty much like all lefties, all civil rights people, feminists, you know, peaceniks, environmentalists, these were the 1950s and 60s definition of the terrorists that they were after and targeted directly, explicitly. And at the end of all this, when this finally gets exposed publicly, Congress, unlike today, creates a committee to study this and say, okay, how do we fix this? And I'm not saying that this worked perfectly or anything, but at least they were forthrightly addressing the problem. We desperately need another one of those. Desperately. We're not going to get it in the here and now, but 2018, 2020, we'll see. Like, maybe finally, and again, this is not Democrat or Republican. This is leadership of the Democrats and Republicans, and then that is against progressives and libertarians. So the best people are like Wyden and other progressives, and like Ryan, or not Ryan, uh, Paul, written Paul, right? The Freedom Caucus is often a huge ally on reigning in government surveillance and corporate surveillance. I don't agree with them on pretty much everything else, but on this particular topic, they're phenomenal. And I work with them all the time. So what else? Well, the Fourth Amendment. Some might argue, like, th this is a very important element that's been systematically undermined by the current surveillance state. And the thing is, like, if this regime had been in place in years earlier, things may have turned out quite differently. In fact, the Fourth Amendment was directly created in, in 1791 in response to what the British were doing. Right? We just finished this war and we're like, okay, what did we learn? That's really what the Bill of Rights is like. Okay, we learned this. Like, 
don't quarter. I mean, you ever read that? Like, you're like, what's the third amendment? Why is it that? You know, it's like, yeah. And here's what it says, right? And I think this is incredibly important because there's no asterisk that's like, oh, unless you're chasing terrorists, child pornographers. I'm not saying like I like terrorists and child pornographers. I'm saying like rule of law says they still get due process. You still have to follow due process. And we don't. We absolutely don't. And we don't on pretty much everyone. That's a problem. I think eventually, I'm all but certain that eventually the courts will have to and will rule that most, if not all, of these programs are illegal and unconstitutional. Because the Fourth Amendment is so clear on this. And we'll look back in the history books of 2050 and be like, it was a dark period, <laughs> right? And we'll talk about be like Dred Scott and whatever that, you know, like, it'll be like that. Because how crazy is it to live in a country with this as part of the Constitution, knowing, as we all now know, that PRISM and Section 702 are sharing our data to law enforcement systematically of hundreds of millions of Americans that have not committed a crime. So today, unlike in COINTELPRO, where we're trying to get like Martin Luther King to commit suicide, true story by the way, if you haven't read the FBI letter to Martin Luther King trying to get him to kill himself, Google it. It was released to the, I think the New York Times in 2014 after they attempted to keep it out of the public view for decades. But today, it's Black Lives Matter, right? What's a black identity extremist? What, what is the race paper that folks have been foying for? They finally did get it foyed, and it was 100% redacted, <laughs> right? And isn't it weird that we got like black identity extremists and not white identity extremists? Last I looked, <laughs> last I looked, we actually had white identity extremists in this country. And yet that isn't even on the radar. What we are finding is that the government is, and again, I can't say illegally yet because it's in the courts in process, but will eventually, I'm quite certainly, be found to have done illegal surveillance of modern civil rights activists. And that's a real problem to me. I think it should be of great concern to anyone that believes in rule of law. It doesn't matter if you agree or disagree with what they're doing. And we're living through that too. So here's the reality, right? Things have shifted. And the tech savvy amongst us are more empowered than we've ever been in human history. Finally, right? Like I've been waiting for this for decades now. And so there's a lot that we can actually do simple things, like on all of your email accounts, social media platforms, et cetera, to turn on what's called two-factor authentication. You do that, you can have pretty much the dumbest password imaginable and still be relatively secure. And I want to tell you, like, none of this guarantees your security, but it addresses like 99.9% .9 of your risk. It's better than a seat belt. <laughs> and there's other things too, right? Like most of us, most of us are sending text messaging in the clear. And by that, what I mean is every text message you send is sent in plain text and is surveillable, not just by the provider, but by anyone that wants to invest the 20 to $500 to surveil you. And the weird thing is, when then Senators Kerry, uh, who was the other one? John Kerry and Luger were still there, right? We briefed Congress, and they were like, well, tell me about how you do surveillance on, on your mobile systems. And so we did, but we did more than that. We actually brought in a bunch of surveillance equipment to the Capitol building and set it up. And we named it, like, do not ever connect to this network. But in essence, if we had named it AT&T, 
all of the cell phones in the Capitol building would immediately connect to our network because it was the strongest. That's how stupid our cellular networks are right now. And so when just this last, what was it, two months ago, people were waving their hands in the air being like, oh my God, I can't believe that there's a rogue data collection system somewhere in DC that could be used for surveillance. We're like, we told you this 10 years ago. <laughs> like, I don't understand why you're still not getting it. So our techs are very insecure, but so are your browsing habits. Oh my goodness. And somebody had asked uh, online, one of the questions was about, you know, like if I delete cookies between sessions, is that enough? It used to be back in the day, you know, like five years ago, that would have been enough. But now there's all sorts of other mechanisms that are being used to track you. In essence, what they do is they collect not just one, but say like 50 or 100 different variables about your computer. The screen size, the different software packages that you might have installed, the you know, different settings that you yourself set. And they collect so many of them, it creates what's called a fingerprint. And that fingerprint follows you around. But there's other stuff, super cookies, cookies that you delete, but then reinstall themselves back on your system. You know, it's like herpes, but for your computer, where you're just like, why won't this go away, right? Like, I mean, it's just horrible. And not illegal. Because our laws predate the existence of that business model. And so now you need to do more. It becomes this cat and mouse game. It becomes a cat and mouse game you can't win. You can alleviate the risk, but you can't win it. Number one thing you can do is put a password. The worst password is better than no password. And a lot of this is actually fairly low-hanging fruit. What's the learning curve on that? Somewhere between two and 30 minutes to lower your risk profile by 99%. So here's the homework that I would give to you, and I give it to all my classes when I teach them too, right? Like, so what is it, the data that you keep? In essence, what happens if people get it? What would people want to do with it? All that. It's a fun dinner conversation or two beer problem, as I call it, right? Like, it's good to, it's good to think about this. Because oftentimes, sadly, the implication is like, if somebody hacked this, not much would really go wrong with me. But if somebody hacks my bank account, <laughs> that's a much bigger problem. And for me, if somebody like hacks one of my social media profiles, it can actually be problematic. People trust the information. And I would imagine just like when the AP gets hacked and people say, oh, there's a bomb in the White House that just went out and the stock market plummets 500 points. Like, people made a lot of money off of that, shorting the market in those few minutes. So what is the data you keep? Again, this is sort of a list of what people tend to relate. This is compiled over the last few years from my class. So it's through the lens of students for the most part, but probably a good amount of this maps onto you guys as well. And it points to, this is the kind of data that you might want to protect. Not just because of the here and now, but because of the implications of it. But there's also all this other stuff. Most of us have self, is there anyone here that actually doesn't have a, a smartphone? One. So, a handful. You guys are the Luddites. <laughs> but also the savvy, right? Like, I, I'd like to believe that you guys just know, like, all the rest of us are totally hosed, but you're relatively safe. Because, in fact, our, our, our devices are informing on us all the time. And again, it's not just what we choose to share. If you have a cell phone that isn't even connected to any service, I don't know, maybe you like to download and watch Netflix or you just like to be seen with a cell phone, whatever that reason is, right? The fact that you come into the same room with somebody else and that you both might have Bluetooth enabled means that their cell phone is tracking and 
and knows that it's come within a certain radius of your cell phone. And that information gets reported upstream as well. So now, when you're thinking about social graphs, it's like if I go and like rob a bank, they want to know, who have you been talking to? Well, they're going to go to my Bluetooth stuff and find out that all you might be conspirators. It's guilt by association. And what does that mean for things like freedom of assembly? These are real world tactics currently being used. And in essence, we have no idea how. I guarantee they are. I just don't know to what extent that's being used to map say, the social graphs of protesters. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Do you guys know that when you type something into Facebook, it keeps that information too? The speed that you, you probably think like when you're like, oh, I'm just going to delete that because I really thought better of what I was writing. If you've not have that moment, bless you. But I'm sort of a cranky old bastard already, so I'm like, hey, you know what? No, 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 no. They keep that information. They know what you thought. I would think that'd be very valuable information. Like the thing that you thought better before sending, I'm like, that's what you really think about this. Right? When Facebook just this last month said, oh, yeah, we totally were keeping all the videos that you deleted. That was a bug. I'm like, that was not a bug. <laughs> that was not a bug. Right? It takes time and energy to delete things from your backups and et cetera. Like, it was not a bug. And we have no idea how much of that. I know that when Windows now is collecting all this information about how you organize your computer, and in Windows 10, and since they've backported the fix to Windows 7 and Windows 8, if you're on any of those systems, even if you turn off monitoring, it still monitors you. You can't opt out. And what can I glean? Well, in the same way that like when you walk into somebody's room or their house and you look around, you get a feel for their personality. Our digital devices do that too. How we organize our information. As the librarians amongst us might say, your information architecture tells us everything we need to know. And if the studies say, like, well, this information architecture is a more effective worker or mo more prone to slackness or indicative of Alzheimer's, whatever it is, again, it's being collected without your informed consent and used for God only knows what. So who would want this information? Again, this is actual... Statements by my students. I like the last one. <laughs> right? It's not hackers for the most part. No hacker really gives a crap about us. <laughs> right? Like we're just not that important. But your insurance company, now they certainly want a lot more information about you. Your future employers, they want a lot more information about you. Right? Corporations that want to sell you the next widget or stupid product, like forget Ginsu knives. This is going to be like totally tailored to you specifically. And you'll think like, I really need that. Even when you don't. Right? If you've had kids any time in the last few years, you know, like you're basically told like you want to be a good parent, you need to put away the cord blood for your kid. It's like only for $1,500 you can be a good parent. I'm like, man, imagine that. Like, until five years ago, we were all bad parents. I'm like, who knew? <laughs> Products that we don't need are now the new norm. And again, like, we got a glancing blow on this. The next generation, the current generation, they're getting this all the time. You can't escape it. So passwords, multi-factor authentication, the use of things like Tor for browsing, Tails, T-A-I-L-S, if you're looking for a secure operating system. But, oh, but mainly increased awareness. That's what we can do as individuals. And then you have to leave the realm of the individual and get into something much, much bigger. 
right? The legislation, the, the regulation, the oversight, the accountability, the consumer protection laws that haven't been updated in decades and desperately need to be updated. So the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, the folks in charge of our communications systems, networks, that set the rules of the road, the parameters for doing business. Right? What are they doing instead of protecting us? Like, what makes the FCC move with blinding speed? Right? We, we have a name for it, right? We call it Nipplegate. And I'm telling you, like, anyone that says the FCC can't keep up, I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> Janet Jackson's boob shows us that the FCC can move quickly on anything it really wants to. And the Federal Trade Commission, right? The Federal Trade Commission, ooh, ooh. Can also do that, should also do that, is in fact required to do that. And I want to spend a little bit of time looking at the FTC because I feel like, you know, this is illegal. If you put your name or your number on the federal do not call list, it's not just illegal, it's illegal and subject to an $11,000 per occurrence fine. And I'm like, I don't understand. Like, I cost somebody hundreds of thousands of dollars a week. What's going on? How can they be this inept at that? How can they forego, or forego all this stuff that they are required under statute to look for, to prevent? How do we have month after month continually headlines showing that the FTC is not doing its job and no one's like, I don't understand. Right? The number one thing, in my mind, that's rampant and isn't being done anything about, right? The FTC is charged to prevent discrimination, and yet that's the new business model. And how awkward is it that when I'm looking up this article, the algorithms are sending me this <laughs> in response, right? Like, so we today are completely enamored by this notion of big data. It's shocking, in fact, just how like enthrall, as it were, we are to big data. It's magic to us, right? We're like, I don't, I don't know what your problem is, but the solution is going to be big data. We've got a profile for that. We've got an algorithm, as if like, I don't know what, the algorithm's written on like a Torah or like, you know, like uh, a couple of golden tablets. Like, where did these algorithms come from? Humans. What do they do? They find new ways to discriminate. Ways that we're told are magically not illegal, but keep being found to discriminate against protected groups. Fourth Amendment be damned. Minority status be damned, right? We know that Google for a while was giving ads for jobs that paid lower to women than men. Is that illegal? Yeah, it's blatantly illegal. And it took independent researchers to figure that out. And what did the FTC do? They said, don't do that again. Right? So if you look at what's been happening, what our attention is on is this. And I want to say, this is pretty bad. <laughs> so here's 10 years ago. Right? So the big ones, uh, Heartland, 130 million, TJ Maxx, 94 million. This is what it looked like. But it's like, you see names that you recognize, even if you don't recollect Gap and AT&T and what have you the U.S. military getting hacked. Today, looks like this. You can't even fit them on there. The scale 
is enormous. And no one anywhere has said, hey, I've got an idea. I can't eliminate all of this, but I can have some sort of liability for the companies that clearly are sucking at their information security. Do you think the FDIC doesn't have standards for banks that are insured? What's the standard for maintaining the integrity of our information? And I'll tell you, it's zero. Which is why when Facebook does what it does, when Equifax does what it does, when all of these companies do what they do, when that information is stolen, sold, granted to the US government, now the US government actually pays for the information, so you're like, it's a double whammy of disaster. Like, none of these companies get held to account. There's no statutory fine for doing things as AT&T has done, putting private information on a public URL. That's shocking. And so we tell them, don't do it again. I'm like, that's not working. So here's the future. Here's what I think is going to happen. I just don't know when, right? Antitrust investigations, protections that have to go to the heart of these algorithms. Programmed by humans, they're not magic. As I tell my students, like, nobody goes to like an arsonist and says, well, wildfires are complicated things that build, burn in complex patterns. You didn't know it was going to like do what it did, so we're not going to hold you accountable. But build an algorithm, and it's like, we didn't know it was going to do that. And they're like, oh, it's fine. We won't hold you accountable. And that's, again, a problem. Consumer data protections, all of these new devices, the smart devices going into our homes, the Roombas that now map your house. Like, I don't want my vacuum cleaner mapping my house. <laughs> like, and selling that information. And you can glean a lot of information simply from the floor plan of somebody's house. Antitrust, stronger privacy protections, telco price gouging, like we pay more than a growing list of other countries for worse service, for worse service in the United States. I'm like, how is that not price gouging? Third party doctrine, this is the law that basically says once you give your data to a third party, you no longer have any control over it as if we were somehow meaning to give away all of our most personal secrets to God only knows who. That has to change. But unfortunately, especially in the immediacy, it's gonna be more of the same. I've seen zero impetus from Congress, from regulators, to fix this problem. And honestly, as a skeptic of a lot of the Obama administrations, like perseveration, Right? I almost have more respect for the folks that are like, I'm totally going to screw you over. Because then I'm like, oh, I'm not going to waste my time talking with you. Versus the let's have a multi-stakeholder, multi-year process where we discuss what should be done without actually making a decision. Which is what the last administration did on this stuff. So here's how to protect yourself, right? The threat vectors is the first step. And I'm going to end actually, since we're about at time, with this, which is that talking to people like me, like Ben, like others in this space. Ben, raise your hands just so people can see you. There you go. Another folk, other folks that understand these things is a great first step, but most importantly to take action. This is, I think, a crisis of our generation. It's an area where we're just going crazy. Right? The infiltration of our most private spaces, our most private thoughts, is unprecedented in human history. And we're doing that with no legal framework, no rule of law. Nothing is too much. And that will continue until a critical mass of individuals, I'm not saying a majority of people, I'm saying a critical mass of individuals, fight for the kinds of reforms that have to be taken that we update our laws, much as we did with the social contract 
after the Industrial Revolution. We had to go through a lot of pain before we did that. I'm hoping that we can do it before the equivalent of, say, like a Great Depression, whatever that digital equivalent looks like. But one of two things will happen. We'll be proactive, or we'll address it after some form of digital catastrophe. You can imagine I'd rather be proactive, but we'll have to do this. OK, with that, I'll draw it to a close uh, and open it up for questions. Thank you. Sure. So uh, this question about what does buying a virtual private network, a VPN, get you? So back to that Skype example and encryption. What a VPN does is it takes your connectivity. I get online, let's say, from my cell phone, grab the cell phone. And I want to go and search Pirate Bay for whatever reason, for research. Well, if I do that, say, from Penn State, Penn State University says, no, 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 we're not going to let you access Pirate Bay from our network. So a VPN says, OK, I'm going to encrypt from your cell phone, from your edge device, to some third-party location. And inside that tube, if you will, that encrypted communication, in this case, Penn State, but my ISP or the US government or whoever your threat is can't access that information. So we use this all the time. For example, business travelers use this all the time to create secure communication back to their corporate headquarters so they know their email isn't being intercepted. No. Okay. No, it just moves it so that that space between your device and wherever that VPN exits is encrypted. And then from that endpoint, you often will go to in my example, Pirate Bay. But for example, for the Olympics, I set up a VPN between here and Canada because I wanted to watch the Olympics. I didn't want to watch whatever crap <laughs> Comcast, NBC, Universal wanted me to watch. And so by VPNing to Canada, it looked to the Canadian servers like I was Canadian. And so they would provide me that content. If I leave the United States, I can't watch Netflix. If I VPN back to the United States, then Netflix says, oh, you're in the United States. I will let you watch whatever craptacular binge thing you want to do. Because from their surveillance perspective, you're actually at a different physical location than you actually are. Correct. Think of it as like, that's right. Think of it as a tunnel from your end device to some other point geographic or otherwise. And once you're in that tunnel, all you can tell is like there's some encrypted traffic. I don't know what it is specifically. There are. Yeah. And, and again, I would I would I have my own favorites, but I would say, you know, if you just Google for VPN reviews and go to a site that is there's a lot I should say once you do that you'll get a zillion bad reviews. But if you go to like PC Magazine or, you know, I keep trying to get Consumer Reports folks to start adding digital products to their portfolio uh, because I feel like we desperately need reviews of these kinds of things in the same way that we do for cars and coffee makers. I think they will. I think they will. But yeah, VPNs are pretty neat things. You can do a lot because Again, we have so many elements, whether it's the Olympics or Netflix or just wanting to secure your communication while you're traveling to the Bahamas. Uh, there's so many uses for them. And you can usually get them for, I'd say, there are some that are free, uh, but usually a good one will be 3 to $10 a month, something like that. Price of a cappuccino or two. Yeah. Right, so the question is, how, how do these 
folks that are collecting information collect that collect the information connect you with somebody that wants to buy that information? And the answer is there's a whole multi-billion dollar industry of data brokers, and that's all they do. Right, so in the same way you can go onto the dark web and be like, so I'm looking for drugs, sex, or like pharmaceuticals. Data brokers are like, I got these data sets, who wants them? And they just do that, that's all they do. And there's very little transparency. There's a great book written by a woman named Julia Engwin. She was a Wall Street Journal reporter at the time called Dragnet Nation, where she talks about this whole structure and her attempts with all of the resources of the Wall Street Journal to remove herself from this panoptic digital environment and what she learned over the course of trying to do that. But data brokerage is, is the, the easy answer. And it's, it's dastardly. It's like, again, wild west, anything goes kind of space. And you can imagine, because the data broker may buy your Amazon information, may buy the stuff from your dating app, may buy the stuff from your grocery card. Like They can put together all of these different facets that you might not have pulled together, but they and their canonical profile of you may have from all these different sources. And there's a great product called, I think it's called Lightbeam, which tracks the, the data brokerages that are tracking you across websites and builds kind of this web to show you how your data is being connected. So in the same way that you might see like the same Amazon ad following you between different places, that is the power of this. And they show you how that data is being sh like shunted between these different, these different websites that you might be visiting. <laughs> there are ways to at least alleviate that. There's something called Privacy Badger that's very good at blocking a lot of this. It basically sits between your browser and the data brokerages and refuses to pass along that information something called Ghostery. There's, again, a number of products out there. Later on in these slides, I have a bunch of URLs that walk you through a bunch of those resources. And uh, again, this is, to me, it's like a two-beer problem, right? You sit down, <coughs> you have your first beer. That gets you used to the idea of, like, I'm actually going to do this. The second beer is, like, while wow, you actually set it up, right? So if you do that, Again, you don't, you don't eliminate all of it. You eliminate 99, 99.9% .9 of it. And you'll see, I'll go to a website sometimes and like Privacy Badger will be like, we blocked, you know, 72 trackers. And I'm like, are you kidding? On one website? That is not all that abnormal. Yeah, well, so cookies was sort of like the old school way to track you. And now they're just way more sophisticated. They're putting all sorts of different mechanisms. And the browsers are often complicit. When you look at the standards bodies for HTML5 and all this stuff, they're building into the technology. And this is actually the political economics of tech development that I write about. Uh, it's getting more insidious. It's built into your operating systems. It's built into your browser. It's built into the functionality of devices now. Yeah, I don't know that you can get a Roomba that now won't map your house. And it's sold as a feature, right? Because it will more efficiently vacuum and then sell your soul, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> let me see, it might even be... Yeah, there you go. So this would be a couple of great places to start. There's a few more later on as well. Yes? Well, I, I conduct my business the old way with stamps and envelopes for the most part. Uh-huh. Yes. They're keeping tabs on people like me, saying that, what, what are you hiding? Yep. Because you refuse to go on. I was on Facebook once. We went on, it wasn't 10 minutes, until someone from my high, husband's high school classroom, 40 years before, pinged on, I want to be your friend. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even an hour. And I said, something like that, I don't want to be a part of, and so I canceled it. 
Yeah, so is using these technologies an indicator of malfeasance? And the answer is the, the NSA does view use of encryption as an indicator that you're up to no good, okay? You value your privacy and they've shunted you into the same bucket. No wonder why they get so many false positives, right? That's, I mean, there's millions of people using VPNs. My, my answer to that is, yeah, that's totally messed up. And the fact that you choose not to use these technologies is absolutely not an indicator of not being up to any good. And that's what has to change. This guilt without evidence is a real problem. It's a presumption of guilt. And it's anathema to our rule of law. And it's very real. I mean, the NSA has said, you use Tor, you use encryption, you use PGP, which are all encryption schemes. Like, that's an indicator to them. Yeah, I thought, your general. Yes. Yeah, so Cambridge Analytica is, it is the breach of the Leviathan. You saw this momentary ripple in the Facebook business model, and everyone's like, oh my God, I can't believe the Cambridge Analytica. Let me just tell you, there are probably dozens, scores, or hundreds of Cambridge Analyticas that did exactly what they did. Minimally. And it's not 87 million. It's over a billion people that have been affected over time by this. These are my presumptions. But I've yet to be too off on them over the last 15 years. Right? That everyone's shocked, simply shocked that there's gambling going. No, it's like this is like I'm shocked that there's it's the business model. It's it's the core of Facebook's business model. So the notion that like people are, you know, concerned that, you know, this data was collected on third parties, I'm like, well, but you built that functionality into your platform. Like somebody sat down and coded it. Like what did you think was gonna happen? And I guarantee there are so many more Cambridge Analyticas out there. In many ways, people are just upset because it's like Cambridge Analytica took this data and then sold it to the Trump campaign. I couldn't care less that they sold it to the Trump campaign. What I care about is that they collected it in the first place, and there's no law that says, like, you go to jail if you do that. I certainly didn't opt in to providing you the power to decide to share my personal information with a third party. But that is the Facebook business model. You yeah. implied that earlier, if I understood correctly, you implied that this situation is not going to change until there's a group of uh, uh, significant, doesn't have to be large, you said, but a critical <laughs> mass yeah. of people who can make this change. Who will the people in that critical mass yeah. I mean, again, this is one of those great opportunities. We, we, we lament the fact that as a society we've become polarized. This is a great unifying element. Like, I work day in and day out with folks on the conservative right. And I am decidedly on the other end of that scale. And it doesn't matter your political affiliation. It doesn't matter who you voted for in the last election. This is like something of profound concern across the board. And that is fighting these centrists that see nothing wrong with this current state of affairs. And unfortunately, they control the legislative and regulatory agenda right now, the centrists. How is that going to change? We're, I mean, to change that? part of that is we're witnessing that process unfolding right now. The reason why there is an unprecedented number of folks retiring from Congress, and it's left and right, well, or I should say it's centrist left and centrist right, but it's all those folks right in the middle and leadership that are jettisoning. I think Pelosi is going to be gone pretty soon too. So that's good. Oh, yeah. 
we are so, in such desperate need of new thought leaders in DC. They'll probably look a little younger, but they'll also, they'll be the folks that are able to say, look, we can keep arguing about abortion and gun rights indefinitely and not make any forward headway. Or we can form a legislative agenda on all of these other issues. And it doesn't matter, populist left, populist right. Like people are like, you know what I'm concerned about? Economics, <laughs> right? What I'm concerned about is job security. What I'm concerned about is like, what's happening to our infrastructure? What I'm concerned about is broadband connectivity. I'm, like these are giant shared areas of interest. But if your goal is to try to balance out the legis like these left and right and maintain power, you keep putting up the exact same elements that split and divide. And I see this day in and day out by leadership of both parties. And they do stupid, crazy stuff, like what's called a, um, filling the tree. So when a bill is introduced, there's a parliamentary trick. When a bill is introduced, you get 30, or sorry, 23 slots for amendments. And when they don't want to have amendments, amendments that would absolutely pass, when they don't want that, they fill those 23 slots with like stupid amendments, like substitute a semicolon for an and, and like, I mean, all this stuff, so that you cannot actually have a democratic, deliberative, iterative process of improving a bill. To me, that's like completely anti-democratic, and it's normative. And so we constantly are finding, like, whether it's you know, Justin Amash trying to introduce an amendment that would absolutely pass on Section 702, or Wyden, so Amash is on the right, or Wyden in the Senate on the left, being like, hey, we're going to, like, so many places where people actively prevent a, if not a consensus, at least majority rule in these spaces. I think the people involved, right? I mean, we forget it's 535 people. And that's not a whole lot of people. Now, oftentimes they're very insulated from things. And I think that we're living through the. I was like, oh. I thought I was just hearing it. No, it was just me. But like, yeah, I, I hate to say it, but there's almost like this rate of attrition, you know, mortality rate holding steady at 100%, like, you know, like, that has to happen to make room. And again, what I see is like, you know, what we're told is like millennials don't care. I hear that all the time on so many different issues. When I talk to millennials, however, they're just like, look, I don't think there's anything I can do on this. And you know what? They're totally right. But it doesn't mean that that group won't immediately see the import of what I'm talking about. But Sasha, yes. do, do you see that group seeing the import? Because they have grown up where they are sharing and using. Uh, they are volunteering this information that is mm -hmm. being collected, and it's normal for them. At one point, if people are going to make a change, what on earth triggers them to look at this differently than they do? Yeah, I would say nobody goes through my course and comes out the same afterwards, right? Like, so, and, and I say that just because, you know, this is to me a digital literacy problem as well. Like, wh when do we teach what the business models are actually doing or how to effectively utilize these very powerful tools, right? When do we teach people to be critical consumers of technology, right? So we got, you know, the three R's and it's like, and digital, eh, whatever, we're just, let it ride, you know? Like, th that is a serious shortcoming on a societal level. If you wanna look at why is it that Europe is so far ahead of us on so many different technical, legal proceedings, Look at the schools and you see that people are taught to be a little more concerned about the Facebooks and Googles and what have you of the world. And I'm not saying they're doing it great. I'm just saying they're doing it far better than we are. And again, we're already seeing, if you're wondering why have I gotten so many new privacy policies in the last few weeks, 
It's because Europe passed a privacy law and all these companies that do business in Europe are now like, oh crap, we gotta comply with that. So we get that benefit too. A little bit. Everybody, thank you so much. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'll stick around to keep talking with folks that wanna 